So, in this talk, I'm going to address a major obstacle to interdisciplinary collaboration and one way that I think that we can bridge the gap between several fields that study choice behavior. And I plan the talk to only take about 25 minutes and I'm, I'm planning on stopping in the middle for questions and then leaving time at the end for discussion. So if you can hold your questions for the first like 15 minutes, great. But if you need clarification along the way, by all means, ask. Um, so what do we talk about when we talk about decision models? But the answer really depends on the disciplinary context. And this is, I think, the greatest challenge to interdisciplinary research. How do we engage meaningful academic conversation when everyone speaks a different language? Um, so one of the things I'll be bringing up is um, the delayed discounting function, which has been studied by many different fields under different names, and there are at least 20 different mathematical forms of it. And so the differences run deeper than jargon. Trying to unite mathematical models is difficult because a lot of times they've been developed under different theoretical structures in isolated fields. And what we really need if we want to be able to have a constructive conversation across fields is sort of a Rosetta Stone in order to unify concepts and translate between disciplinary languages. So over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to argue the case for using something called psychological distance as that Rosetta Stone and show how it can be used as a unifying construct and framework for interdisciplinary models of choice behavior. Um, so this is the model I'm building up to. You don't have to worry about the terms right now. Um, I will define them all. But basically what this says is that we can map objective values onto subjective perception by using something called psychological distance. And that the relationship behaves so that when something is very close psychologically, it will tend to be valued higher and sometimes even overvalued, especially in, in a relationship to something that's very distant psychologically, where we tend to see things undervalued. Um, so I'm first going to give you a crash course in psychological distance. After that, uh, beginning from delay discounting, I'm going to build the theoretical construct of this model from existing theory. Um, and then I'll talk about the flexibility and interdisciplinary nature of the model by showing how it can be used to explain not only delay discounting, but the endowment effect, loss aversion, and some interesting savings behavior, all of which up to now have required separate analysis and theoretical frameworks. So lastly, I'll touch on some limitations that I see with the construct, and then I want to leave plenty of time for discussion. So starting with delayed discounting, um, it's the tendency to choose small, immediate payoffs over large, delayed rewards. Um, this is something that has been seen for many, many years in many, many contexts. And um, lots of different fields are interested in researching it, but it goes by different names. So psychologists want to know how impulsivity and personality and self-control operate and how this affects well-being. So why do we smoke when we know it causes cancer? And why do we binge eat when we want to lose weight? Economists are interested in uh, how this affects resource management and personal financial decisions. So how do we create economic, sustainable economic systems when the focus is on the short term? And why don't public policymakers seem to have the next generation in mind? And why do people fly to Florida for the weekend when they don't have money in their 401k? Um, in marketing and accounting literature, you'll see them talk about um, short-termism. And they discuss the issues of shareholders putting pressure on corporations to have short-term profits even at the expense of long-term uh, health of the firm. And so, so when I talk about delayed discounting, I'm talking about the tendency to discount the future when weighing it against the present. So, psychological distance, my favorite topic. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty general term. It's been employed in literature since at least the 1950s. Uh, most famously, Trope and Lieberman, um, some psychologists um, who have turned into behavioral economists, um, have used it extensively in their work on construal level theory, which I'll define in a minute. Um, these citations here are just to show that this has been is a well-studied topic. It's been in literatures from economics, psychology, marketing, even neurology. Um, and what we know about psychological distance is that it's made up of at least four dimensions. 
temporal, so it's got a time dimension, spatial, social, and hypothetical. And these are internal estimates of how close or distant something feels, not how close or distant they actually are. So for our purposes, we'll define psychological distance as the subjective feeling of closeness to or separation from an object, event, or idea. Now, we all know what it's like to be too close to a situation to be objective, right? We've even written laws to make sure that doctors and judges recuse themselves in situations where their closeness might compromise their judgment. Um, that subjective sense of closeness is what we call psychological closeness. And when something is psychologically close, details get blown out of proportion and you can lose the bigger picture. But likewise, when something is too distant, you can see the overarching point, but lose maybe some important details. Now, how does this affect our mental representations? Well, if you look at this picture, you can see, just barely, a person and a building separated by a distance. In this picture, both the person and the building are equidistant from you, the observer. And geometrically, that's the only place you can stand to actually uh, see their relative sizes accurately. Okay, so uh, which object would you say is the most important in this picture? The building, right? Most people would say the building. It's bigger, it takes up more of our field of vision, it has more detail, and so we assume that it's the primary subject of the image. But if we just shift our perspective a little bit so that we're closer to the man, now he feels more important. We brought him closer spatially, but psychologically we've added detail, and uh, we, he takes up more of our field of vision, and so psychologically we've pulled him closer. He takes up more importance in the image now. So the purpose, the importance here is that if for people who are um, gathering data, to know that the way that people represent things to themselves mentally matters when they're considering scenarios. But psychological dis distance isn't just a visual thing. Um, this is a visual aid, but I'm trying. To, we also um, see this on the temporal level. So we experience time this way too. So this is like being equidistant from the man in the building, right? This is today and next year. But we normally don't think of today and next year from the perspective of six months from now, right? We usually, when we think about today and next year, it looks more like this, right? The immediate seems overly important when compared to the distant. The distant. And this is why we tend to undervalue the past in comparison to the future because it's diminished in our mind's eye. So that's psychological distance, but can we manipulate it? Yes, we can. And this is where construal level comes in. Um, construal level is, is very closely tied to psychological distance, and it describes the type of mental representation that a person forms of an event or an object. So are you focused on fine details or on the overarching point? Uh, a low-level construal is like looking at something close up. So it emphasizes the concrete, the details, the experiential aspects. A high-level construal is like looking at something from a great distance, and it emphasizes the abstract, overarching factors, the big picture, focusing on why rather than how. So a low-level uh, description of this picture would be ringing a doorbell. And a high-level construal would be seeing if somebody is home. Right? So one is focused on the how, the other on the why. One is detail specific, the other is less contextualized. What's interesting is that we tend to use low-level construal when we think about things that are psychologically close, and high-level construal when we think about things that are psychologically distant. And through tons of experiments over the years, this has shown to be such a deeply ingrained part of our mental representations that if we force ourselves to think about a distant event in great detail, we'll tend to feel closer to that event, as if we've shrunk the time. You know, time hasn't shrunk, but it's the sense of importance gets greater because we bring it closer to ourselves psychologically. So the same effects have been seen when we manipulate vividness, emotional intensity, and even whether you think of something from the first person or the third person perspective. Um, so we can manipulate it. Can we measure it? Well, lots of people have tried. <laughs> There's a lot going on, um, at least in trying to measure the time, um, the, how time maps on to our subjectivity. So Zauberman did an experiment in 2009 that I'm actually recreating right now in our SSI survey. And what he said was, two questions. 
First, imagine you're given the option to take either a $50 gift card that's valid today or a card of greater value that will be valid in three months. What is the smallest amount that would make you choose the second card? That's actually my wording of his question. But then the second one, how long does the time between today and three months from now feel to you? And between extremely short and extremely long, you mark on the line, right? And then he took a ruler and actually measured all these lines and compared it to the amounts that people said. And there were three conditions. One was a three month, one was a one year, and one was a three year. Okay, and what he found was that we do not have a linear perception of time. Okay, so time is linear. So three months in one year, right here, and then, you know, the one year to three year shrinks. That's why the, um, that's why the slope changes there. But time is linear. But people three months from now felt farther away from t than today. One year felt a little bit farther away than three months, but definitely not four times as far. And three years, 36 months, felt farther away than three months, but not 12 times as far, not nearly 12 times as far. And what he ended up concluding from his data was that time contraction follows the Weber-Fechner law, which basically just says it, it follows a logarithmic curve. But there's a huge debate. He's not the only person that studied this. A lot of people agree with the Stevens law that it follows a power law. But the fact that we contract our perception of time as it gets larger has been studied over and over and over. And in fact, the economists in the room might be interested that when he then calculated these people's discount function based on the values that they said in the first question, when he used the objective time, the discount function drops as the time gets larger. But when he used subjective time, the slope changed, uh, changed sign. So that's actually pretty intense right there. Uh, so this has actually been studied so much and by so many different people. Don't worry, that you're not supposed to read that. It's just supposed to be overwhelming because these are the 21 <laughs> different versions of the delay discounting function that are in use throughout the literature um, all over. Some people prefer the hyperbolic, some prefer the exponential, some people like the arithmetic, some like the quasi-hyperbolic. It depends on which discipline you, uh, you basically grew up with, right? Which one were you taught? And this is what I mean when I say Organizing these things creates difficulty in trying to have really constructive interdisciplinary conversation about questions. We're all asking the same questions, but we have such different ways of trying to answer them that it becomes difficult to really work together across disciplines. So this is where we get to see all t of the first 20 can be reduced. Doyle in 2013 um, reduced all of these to one common theoretical statement. And what this means, if it will come up, is that the discount rate is essentially mapping objective value and time onto, with each, each one has a subjectivity parameter, little s and big S, and then the change values interact in some way. So that's just a generic operator. So all this is saying is that um, value and time are altered by some subjective function in our mind by individual processes and then those changed uh, values interact with one another to give us our subjective discount rate. Okay? And all of those discount functions are different versions of this which make different assumptions about little s, big F and the operator. So a researcher could say, well I think big S is logarithmic because I agree with Zauberman or they can say, I think it's exponential because I think Stevens was right. And people have been arguing about that for 20 years. But at least in this format, we can have that argument a lot easier because we're all starting from the same construct, right? And it applies across all the different ways of approaching the discount function. So this is our first glimpse at the Rosetta Stone.